Hi, everyone. Welcome to Industry Insights Episode 4, Integrating Virtual Reality and BIM. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. With the adoption of BIM and the progression of technology, virtual and augmented reality are finding their place in the AEC space. Today we will discuss the roadblocks the BIM industry faces in fully implementing VR, the deliverables and logistics when it comes to using VR and BIM, VR and BIM projects currently underway, and the exciting things to come in the future by integrating virtual reality and BIM. I'm pleased to introduce Unify's very own BIM specialist, Jay Merlon, as our host today. Jay will be conducting today's live interview with Logan Smith and Simon Manning, co-founders at Bevel Space. Their company provides virtual and augmented reality experiences for visionary companies to stimulate user experiences. Today, we will get their insight on how virtual reality is pushing the BIM industry forward and the limitless possibilities virtual reality and BIM have in store. If you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, please use the key tool at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask. We will answer your questions at the end of our 30-minute interview. Without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Jay to get the interview started. Jay, take it away. Um, I'm sorry about that. It looks like we may be having some technical difficulties hearing Jay. Sorry about this. Just one second. Let's let me get this solved. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay. I think, uh, I, can you guys hear me now? Sorry about that. Sure can. I can hear you. <laughs> Let's try that again. All Jay, right. It's kind of... <laughs> All right. So thank, thank you, Laura. So <laughs> Simon and Logan, it is great to have you guys on the show. Uh, so I'd like to just kick off the discussion with uh, you both telling us about your professional careers and how you ended up becoming VR and AR specialists. Uh, so Simon, do you want to get us started here? Yeah, sounds good, Jay. Um, so my kind of intro into the, the world of architecture began as a model maker. Um, I actually ran the model building studio for ZGF Architects, and my whole world was focused around communicating these complex ideas of space and form and approach. And uh, so naturally, as virtual reality goggles like the Oculus um, came out, I started implementing those to kind of streamline my job. Um, started out with just kind of uh, making model mockups so we could decide how that process went and make fewer of them. And then eventually we realized that it could apply to uh, like full scale medical mockups as well. And, and it kind of just snowballed from there um, until eventually I, I met Logan. Hi there, that's me. <laughs> Um, actually, yeah, I, similarly to Simon, I started out working in architecture. I did uh, architecture school, started at a firm, uh, went through all of my, uh, actually got my license, went through all the tests and everything, uh, practiced for a while, um, and then virtual reality technology started to mature to the point where we had these consumer headsets and AR started get go getting going with the HoloLens and then spreading from there. I got really excited about it. Um, a lot of parts of the architecture practice had been frustrating. Um, the difficulty in connecting, I'd say, the human experience with the design tools uh, was pretty difficult for me. So I got really into it. I started uh, up the virtual reality um, efforts at my firm and then uh, met Simon and we uh, started this venture. Well, that sounds awesome. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, exciting things happening in our industry and, and VR and AR being one of them. Um, so uh, tell us more about Bevel and about how you guys formed the company and, and um, more about what you guys do as well. Uh, yeah, so we We've got three of us co-founders and we're uh, starting to grow now because everything's uh, catching on and it's pretty exciting. Um, it's always been a little bit difficult to define in a sentence what the company is because it's not a role that's ever existed before. Uh, we are uh, creative technologists. We focus in 
AR and VR and uh, primarily serve the AEC industry because that's our background. It's sort of our uh, special niche. Yeah, and as for how we all kind of got started, it was it was essentially we realized that the two of us were in these like in these silos at our respective firms um, with these great ideas of solutions for the industry, but we weren't really able to properly share those or kind of spread the gospel, so to speak, um, from from our positions. And so, rather than kind of being these separate competitors in these other cities and trying to kind of work on our own, we decided to kind of join forces um, and kind of create Bevel as a way of um, spreading these ideas, so to speak, uh, just kind of getting the good word out about how this spatial technology can apply to this industry that we all care about so much. Yeah, I think we were both itching to strike out on our own because there's, there's so much inefficiency in reinventing the wheel, every single firm having to reinvent the wheel for themselves. And, uh, some mutual friends kept saying, no, you guys need to meet each other right now. <laughs> and I'm definitely... <laughs> I think before tying the knot and starting, back, <laughs> we met once in person um, at a happy hour. And then um, basically from then on, we pivoted to uh, using Rec Room as like a virtual meeting space um, for oh, okay. like handling negotiations for how this business was going to be run, we thought what better medium to use than VR for, you know, since we are kind of spread between Seattle and Portland, um, it made it a little bit easier to kind of bridge that gap getting started. So that virtual meeting platform, that, that is a virtual reality meeting space? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> I mean, some would call it, uh, so it's called Rec Room, and the idea is that it's like, um, a, a community recreation, like there's a whole lot of games. It kind of started out as like Frisbee golf in VR and then <laughs> it's evolved into this like massively multiplayer kind of metaverse. <laughs> and so it just, they just happen to have lounge spaces with whiteboards that you can meet up with and kind of have a private room to yourself. And so we decided to meet there and we had, you know, as much whiteboards and a bunch of different colored markers to just sketch out our ideas. We've actually tested a lot of purpose-built meeting spaces and haven't found one that we liked better than just Rec Room. I mean, it's free, right. readily available. You don't even need VR to use it, actually. But <laughs> nice little... Well, that that sounds awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. I'll have to check that out. Very interested in seeing that. I've done some um, kind of virtual chat rooms myself using the Samsung Gear VR, and mm -hmm. it, it is really an experience. Yeah, I, I really see uh, telepresence and what VR offers in that way as being a really big uh, strength for the technology as well, especially in the industries of like architecture and construction, being able to remotely collaborate with teams inside of a 3D space is uh, it's actually kind of a, a new frontier as far as what we can do and what kind of efficiencies we can find in that. Um, but yeah. absolutely tons of off-the-shelf options, and then we're, you know, we're building this stuff into our tools as we go as well. Cool. Yeah, and I ran into Simon at uh, Autodesk University in Vegas just last week, um, and you mentioned that Bevel ended up sharing a booth with Unity, and for those that don't know, Unity is a gaming engine that has gained a lot of traction actually in our space, in the AAC space. Um, so can you guys tell me a little bit about is there a collaboration between you and Unity, and is there some sort of a working relationship? Yeah, so um, Unity, as you're saying, it was originally built as a game engine, uh, but what we've been discovering is that these game engines, uh, they've made them very good at doing calculation, doing interaction, doing visualization in three dimensions, which makes them really perfect development platforms for AEC. I mean, really any kind of design field if we're designing 3D objects or 3D spaces, uh, they work very well for that. And so Unity, I think, is really, um, they're shifting to put a lot more effort in. They've got dedicated staff now in a building and department just to support uh, AEC. And this uh, particular Autodesk University was a bit of a coming out party for them in a way. And so they needed 
good examples of people using their platform to develop for AEC. Um, they saw a demo of ours a while back and were int- we were introduced to them by a, a mutual friend, I guess. Um, they liked the demo and said, hey, can you please show something like this in our booth? And we can talk about how our platform is being used to help the industry. Well, that is awesome. That, is, that sounds like a great opportunity for, uh, for both of you guys. Um, yeah, it, it was really fantastic for us. It was uh, a chance to talk to a lot more people than we normally would have about things that are, we're passionate about. That's great. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into some, um, some details on projects. So like more specifically on how VR and AR can be used in our industry. Uh, what are some use cases that you guys see that are really changing the way we design and construct buildings? Oh man. Um, there's, <laughs> where do, you, where do you start? I feel like a big part of our job right now is just uh, like assessing the sea of possibility for this technology. Um, and then just trying to like pluck ideas out of this. Like, I mean, there's so many, there's so many ways people can use this technology, but in this particular instance, like I see on the, the screen here is our uh, medical simulation uh, that we, we built. And for this, we were actually using, um, we were talking just about Unity. Um, for this whole project, it was all built in Unreal Engine. So we're kind of uh, exploring the, the, the range of options as far as what kind of software tools are available to build this stuff. In this instance, um, the way that we're uh, we're kind of using client data, which is uh, these lean um, sort of workflow diagrams, which are just spreadsheets of, you know, Joe goes to the lobby, then he goes to the, you know, waiting room, then he goes to the exam room, like these kind of processes that are really hard for um, architects and medical planners to just look at a spreadsheet and assess its efficacy or, you know, a kind of apply it to their different design spaces. And so, this particular project, we uh, we read that data and kind of funneled it through um, this game engine to automatically populate essentially like a, like a non-player character from a video game. They're just walking around from point to point for a specified amount of time, and suddenly we can you know ex- extrapolate this data to new designs and kind of compare you know A/B testing to what they're working with now, what they're working with next. But this is just an example of you know, we, we kind of plucked the, the medical planning visualization out of the sea of options, and this is what we came up with. I mean, some of the other applications are um, the actual physical mock-ups themselves. They, they rent warehouses for, for this kind of design process, and um, a lot of that iteration in the warehouse format can be replaced with um, even just a bank of VR headsets in a conference room. Um, so there's, there's kind of in the medical space alone, there's maybe three or four huge value add or, or cost saving opportunities with this tech. But then if you turn to construction, um, I mean, Logan's been doing a ton of rad stuff with augmented reality. Um, Logan, you want to. Yeah. Um, ag- augmented reality is really exciting to me. Um, the. So the project that we brought to uh, the Unity booth uh, at Autodesk University, and no, Brett Young, I did not forget your name. He was the one who introduced us, and I just got a text saying, really? (laughs) Couldn't remember my name? (laughs) Uh, Brett is very good at connecting people. That's that's a talent of his, and we are grateful for it. Um, But the, the application that we brought there was where you basically point an iPad at a drawing set and, oh, you've got it up here. Perfect. And the uh, model from exported from Revit shows up there on the drawing set cropped to the same views as are shown on that plan. Because a lot of people have trouble reading 2D plans and parsing what that actually means. And even if you're an expert in the field uh, and you've been doing this for a long time and have experience, there's still information that isn't on the sheet that you want to get access to. So we have the BIM da- data and the BIM model brought right here on onto the sheet where you can look at it and understand what the drawings are trying to show. 
um, that was that was really exciting for a lot of people. There's a lot of use cases in meetings like uh, design review board meetings or client buy-off meetings, or even getting uh, people on the construction site to understand the 2D drawings better. Um, and then beyond that, I'm getting more and more excited about this, the potential in one-to-one -one construction site augmented reality where you have a BIM model overlaid exactly onto the real world um, aligned with it automatically. So you have a physical wall there and then you have your BIM with all of its metadata saying, this is what this wall is supposed to be. Uh, yes, you need to be uh, putting in all of the fire protection and um, a lot of people are asking us for that use for quality control uh, to prevent rework. Uh, and it's all very similar technology, but it gets really exciting the more specific problems that we start to apply it to. Absolutely, yeah, that totally, that makes total sense, especially on the construction side, because as you said, it, it does get difficult to read a 2D plan, um, and there's often missing information as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, this this one shot up, up I, ha I have here is really intriguing to me because you can still see the 2D plan sort of you know underlaid under that model. So very cool stuff there. Um, and just so all of our listeners know, um, Bevel has a YouTube channel which I've, I've taken these screenshots from their videos. So I do highly recommend that you, you check out these videos because these screenshots definitely do not do these projects justice. I mean, they have uh, videos where you can sort of, you see them sort of orbiting around these sheets and you can see that model kind of um, augmented onto a drawing. So again, very, very cool. Mm -hmm. stuff, guys. And by the end of the week, uh, I'm hoping that Apple will finish approving the demo app. So with this particular application, we will be able to send you PDFs of the drawings and send you the demo so that you could actually put it on your own iPhone or iPad and try it off for yourself if, if that's something that you're thinking about using in your firm. Very cool. So would I print out a drawing and then use your demo app and look at the drawing on, on a table using the app? Exactly. I mean, just the same way that we're using it here. Uh, at this, right. I guess, at this, yeah, I personally would love to get into that. That would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the augmented reality and virtual reality, it's hard to really understand what it's like unless you're doing it because the whole thing is the screen, your computer screen isn't quite adequate. Drawings that aren't quite adequate, and that also comes with trying to communicate how the augmented reality or virtual reality projects work. It is always a challenge to help people to understand the potential of the technology until they try it for themselves. Right, definitely. All right, so this is a second um, video that you guys have on your YouTube channel, which again, uh, I, I think it's a similar platform. Would this, would this model and drawing be available in, that, in the demo that you mentioned as well? No, actually all of the demo is gonna be using the other project. This is, um, mm -hmm. what we're showing here is actually the precursor to the app that you were showing earlier. Oh, okay. Great. Well, this, this one as well, for all of our listeners out there, definitely check out this video. Some, there's some very cool demonstrations that they do on video. Um, this, uh, this last one that I pulled off of your um, YouTube channel um, was, was also cool because it shows um, annotations on this mm -hmm. object that is you know, extruded from a drawing. Can you guys talk to us a little bit about this one? Yeah, and this one, we actually had it pull directly from the annotations that were on the sheet. Uh, the cool thing about working with BIM to make these is that all of this information is a lot more, I mean, it's it's there, it's within the BIM. Uh, we are generally working with Revit. Most of our clients are in the US and that's sort of the uh, thousand pound gorilla. Um, and so in this case, we have these Revit drawings and we just pulled this stuff directly from it. Fun fact, this is the this is the demo that Unity saw and that made them invite us to work with them in Autodesk University. Very cool. 
Uh, so those were a few examples that I, I had pulled um, from what I've seen of your work. But do you guys have any other projects that you'd like to share with us? Um, I think um, the rest of them are kind of under some level of NDA. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking through. I mean, I guess just without giving any specifics, we do. We also work in immersive virtual reality. Um, things like HTC Vive and Oculus. Um, and while there are some projects where really making it look great is a part of the job, um, we, we really push towards interactivity. Uh, we, we like this as a design tool where we're delivering data, both giving, delivering data to the user and letting the user input, getting, getting data from the user to assist the design process. Um, I think a lot of the perception in the industry of what virtual reality and augmented reality can do are, they, I guess, is just showy um, because those platforms are generally marketing themselves for entertainment and games, but uh, the potential that we see and that we are working on is definitely tools. These things are are useful. They're interactive and data driven. Yeah, there's a special kind of ergonomics that comes out of um, VR and AR because you're actually working with your real your body in a physical space. So things like where shelves are placed and you know casework and kitchens and things like that are perfect uh, for this kind of immersive tech because suddenly you now know what's comfortable as opposed to just kind of working on uh, maybe plans or elevations and kind of trying to keep things in pure just dimensions. Now, when you add the kind of the human element to it, um, it really enhances the kind of data you can put in and get out of that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really amazing the amount of information that you can get from very subtle human kinds of movements. Um, our, our friend Alex Colom in New York from Agile Lens talked about using VR in uh, theater design and how he used to make renderings from all these different seats around a theater. And then putting, getting into VR, just the subtle thing of being able to lean slightly to the left, you understand so much more about your place in the theater, the quality of the view, how far away the stage feels to someone sitting in that seat. Even though it is a very small thing, you would think it would be the same as the rendering, but it you just can't communicate things like scale and distance and proportion and interaction with the space in any other way. Right, absolutely. And I can imagine, you know, like a building owner or a client um, or, you know, a user group, say like a doctor um, trying to verify uh, the layout of a, of a lab or an operating room, they, being immersed in this virtual technology is probably infinitely better and more productive than looking at a 2D plan, which they probably don't look at every day. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually, uh, along with the, um, that layout tool that Simon was talking about earlier, uh, we have one that we have used with some clients where the doctors and the nurses and the people who are going to be using the space, not only can they get into the space and see how it feels, but they can actually grab and move and manipulate where all those things are as a kind of an instantaneous ergonomics iteration where these people don't have to learn about how to use any kind of complicated software. It's as simple as you put on the headset. If, uh, this tray of tools or if these wall mounted devices don't feel like they're in the right spot, you reach out, grab them and put them somewhere else. Um, so that way we can get the actual users involved in the design process in an intimate way without them having to understand all of the tools that the architects are using and without the architects having to just guess. Right. Right. That seems like an efficiency gain right there. Mm -hmm. That is, that is very exciting stuff. Um, so we've talked a lot about projects and, you know, use cases. Now I'd like to get a little more technical. Um, so I know that, you know, we met, we talked about uh, Unity and uh, Unreal. Um, so what, what is your process like when going from BIM to VR? 
Um, yeah, I can I can talk about that. It's it definitely is different depending on what we are targeting in our projects. Um, so if we're if we're going for more of a static experience uh, with where visual fidelity is really key, then we'll have similar to a renderer's pipeline, we'll be going through 3ds Max, um, which can do a lot to optimize uh, the BIM models. But if we need to access the metadata, which can be really powerful when we actually get it into the game engines, then we, we want a, an actual BIM kind of export process. Uh, the one we used most recently on this uh, augmented plans project was Tritify that takes an IFC export out of Revit or I guess any IFC export. Uh, this, in this case, it was right out of Revit and then plops that right into Unity in a way that is very easy to read for a Unity developer. So we can get at all those different parameters and then analyze those or display them however we need to. Uh, there's other applications, Pixies, which is P-I-X-Y-Z. Uh, very difficult to guess that if you just hear Pixies. Um, and then <laughs> the big announcement that Unity made with Autodesk at the AEC keynote was that they are working on a more integrated and streamlined process. They're targeting quarter three of 2019, I believe. Um, but yeah, as an example, when we use Tritify, we do an IFC export and then it crunches down on their website, on their servers, optimizing and, and reformatting it, then get the plugin from the asset store in Unity, um, and then import that. And it brings in all those raw files into our project browser and into our scene, it pops it there with, you know, scaled properly and with all of the individual elements and all of their data attached, and then it's just ready to go. Very cool. Um, so no, I, I know that the game engines and some of the other applications that you mentioned, um, they, they work great with AR and VR, but I, I realize that they, that these platforms still require some custom code. Um, and I can imagine when, you know, using BIM and VR together, there would be definitely some custom code there when you're working with the data, as you mentioned. So how much effort would you say is put into the custom development piece for this process? Um, I would say, I mean, it definitely requires custom code at some point from someone in order to produce custom interactions or custom results, but also uh, I mean, the way that game studios work generally is you have some coders, some 3D artists, some technical artists doing scene stuff. And so if you, if you have somebody setting up a project for you who is a coder and they're building all the tools for you, they can definitely set it up so that someone without having to write a single line of code can go in there and use that game engine project um, for a new project and use it over and over again, whatever the custom coder has set up. And then also if people are intimidated by the, uh, you know, writing out for loops and learning syntax, uh, take Unreal, for example, there's a totally visual scripting language. Simon would probably speak better to that. Yeah, it actually, um, that was part of what drew me to Unreal to begin with is I had a lot of experience with Grasshopper and uh, that kind of node-based programming. And so whenever I went to Unreal, I found that I could kind of carry over a lot of my kind of like logic chains and like how the data is flowing through. Although what I realized is the, the kind of, it, it kind of spoiled Grasshopper for me because then I realized how limited that format was compared to Unreal where you're, you can call new executions and run things in parallel. Whereas Grasshopper, it's kind of a, you know, a, a continuous stream from beginning to end. Here on Unreal, I could kind of lay out these atlases of code where this would run when this happens and this would run when this other thing. So it, was, it kind of let me expand on that knowledge a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, definitely what Logan was saying about 
building these tools. I mean, the the extensibility of these game engines, I think, is what makes them so powerful. Um, a lot of people ask us, you know, which one should they choose, Unreal or, or uh, Unity? And it's like, I mean, honestly, it comes down to just pick one and go, like use something because it really multiplies your effort whenever you're, you're starting to produce renderings or fly throughs or any kind, all of the kinds of things that we're interacting with, uh, with BIM data uh, to generate like these game engines, um, they really enhance that dramatically. So um, at this point, I mean, it's essentially just whatever you're comfortable with, um, whatever, whichever one kind of appeals to you, just run with it. Uh, we haven't really found a huge difference in the two, uh, those two main game engines as far as like, does one offer any tremendous um, advantage over another? And at this point, they're getting down to such fine grain and advanced features that the, the sort of average use case for AEC is well within like kind of bo what both engines are great at, which is manipulating data and kind of visualizing it. So. Great. Yeah, that, that's helpful to know about uh, the two different game engines because they're probably um, sort of going head to head right now in, in our space. Um, but what about, so programming languages? So for any of our listeners that are interested in, in VR and picking up a programming language, is there a specific language that either of you would recommend? So my, I, I mean, I went through the same question uh, a few years ago and I went with C sharp because uh, I liked, I was working as an architect, as I said, and I really liked the same language was good for Revit plugin programming uh, and was also the primary language for programming Unity. So that way I was kind of two birds with one stone. <laughs> yeah. Cool, that definitely makes sense. All right, so let's start to talk more about BIM and its role in VR and AR. Um, so obviously the models you receive from your clients contain BIM objects such as a Revit family. Now, how critical is it to have good uh, BIM content or Revit families when transitioning from BIM to VR? Very. Uh, in fact, the way that we work with our clients is generally we, we have a conversation with them about scope and features and what's important to them in the custom applications that we're building. And then we always get the files from them before we give a bid. So we, we won't attach any hard numbers to how much a project will cost until we have actually walked through the Revit model, taken a look at what kinds of, uh, what is the quality of the modeling and the quality of the assets within it. Because that can represent a huge cost to us if we have to then go in and fix it all ourselves. So would you, it, let's say that there is um, uh, quite an effort to fix a, um, a client's model. Do you, do you jump into their, say, Revit model and, and make the changes on their end so that they're, they're within the native, native design model? Or does, it, does most of that processing happen on your end, like as an export? So sometimes we can talk through with the client how to improve their own model because, I mean, ideally, if, if we have, if they hand us a, a poorly made BIM model and then we have to do all the work to fix it, we're not going to be working within their central model. That's, that's outside of what we insure ourselves for. Um, right. And so if they, if they can fix that model, then it's improving their own BIM model, which they can reuse and get benefit out of that in their own process. Whereas if we have to fix it completely ourselves, then that is only improved for the sake of this uh, AR VR project. So if we can help clients or advise clients on how to take care of it themselves, that can reduce the costs of um, what we have to charge our clients and it can help them have a more efficient process overall because better BIM pays itself off over and over again. Very true. And how do your processes and workflows really support the data side of them? Are you, are you um, 
Uh, you know, I saw earlier on the AR utility poll, there was some metadata shown and, and displayed to the end user. Is, is that something that you guys are, are building, like sort of more of these interactive virtual environments where you can start to browse the data within um, BIM? Yeah, the, uh, I guess sort of a, a mantra on this augmented reality with uh, design and construction is data in context. And that, that goes both ways, whether you're on the construction site with AR laid, overlaid and you need to access information about where you are right now, you have the context of where you are. Or if you are looking at data, you have the context of all of the model around you. Um, the same with input. Uh, if you are there within your design model and you are needing to mark down um, changes or notes or quality control uh, to-dos, if you are punch listing, then that data is within the context of its space and time. All right. All right, so let's, I mean, I'm sure we could have an entirely separate discussion on hardware and devices that support VR and AR, just because it seems like every day we see improvements on these devices, mm -hmm. as well as entirely new companies being formed um, to manufacture new devices. Uh, so I'm curious, in, in your current experience, what devices and hardware have you been playing with, and, and what's your favorite so far? <laughs> Speaking of favorites. Uh, <laughs> right there up on the screen. <laughs> yeah, I actually I had a short conversation with Simon about uh, Magic Leap, so I thought I would throw this on the <laughs> slide. Yes, well, sadly, Logan has our one and only Magic Leap, so. <laughs> I'm not sad about it. <laughs> sure, you could talk a little bit more about some of the red stuff. Yeah, I mean, a little bit like the platforms, it's, it's more important to be using something than to worry about which one to use. I mean, we definitely have our preferences because we're steeped in this stuff. Um, when it comes to virtual reality, uh, whenever possible, I favor something with six degrees of freedom, kind of an industry term, but basically if it can track your movement through space as well as just which direction you're pointing, then there's a lot more information that is being served to your brain, a lot more interactivity possibilities um, and then with augmented reality, you basically, you have your handheld mobile, which, um, we have found a lot more use for than we originally anticipated because it is so ubiquitous. Everyone probably who is listening to this, uh, has an AR device in their pocket. Um, and then when it comes to the headsets, there's... For AR, there's HoloLens and Magic Leap are the are the two big ones. Magic Leap is obviously more advanced. It's it came three years later. HoloLens actually you can use it on a job site because it comes it has a hard hat attachment available and it is uh, certified safety glasses, which is really cool. Um, but then the Magic Leap has is a lot more powerful and has input methods that enable a lot more robust kinds of interaction. It has a, a controller with six degrees of freedom so that you can use precise controls, kind of like the VR headsets. It has eye tracking. It has a more robust hand tracking. It's a really fun platform to develop for because of how much we can have people interacting with their designs. It's just less accessible. Um, it's very new. It has a much higher price point and not very many people have them. Um, can you, I thought I saw one of your videos on the YouTube channel that was sort of demoing an, an iPad app as well. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the AR platform. Do you have anything to add about that? That seems like it, it was out, what, like a year or so ago? Um, so we've got a few. The, the app that we did for Autodesk, also the augmented plans, that was on iPad. And we've used iPads for full-scale job site augmentation. Um, I mean, the advantage is there, everybody, everybody can see what's on the screen. So for meeting kinds of settings, 
it's really great to be able to, like, either everyone's got their own iPad or iPhone or whatever, or everyone can gather around one and see what's going on. Um, and then when we talk about those six degrees of freedom, those devices actually have them through the camera and a combination of camera and accelerometers. They're uh, tracking their movement through space. So you can have surprisingly uh, powerful, I'd say, interactions with your models. Um, it doesn't have quite the same immersive experiential kind of quality to head-mounted devices, but again, accessibility, it often wins out. It is just so much easier to have people using it. It's less intimidating. You don't have to strap anything onto your face. So we end up doing a surprising amount of uh, handheld AR projects. Awesome. All right, so before we jump into the Q&A session where we um, are going to allow our listeners to ask you guys questions, um, I'd like to just kind of open up the floor to both of you. And if you guys have, first of all, if you guys have any advice for foods that would like to ensure they're creating VR ready models. Um, I know we touched a little bit about preparing models in, in terms of BIM um, with good, good quality, but do you have any specific advice for any of the firms that might be looking to work with you guys? Um, yeah, we can definitely speak to that. Um, we would say definitely be, be designing with three dimensions in mind. A lot of uh, architects, especially old school or engineers, are still thinking as if it's drawings, but using a BIM uh, software to make the drawings. And you end up with a lot of problems that are very silly and very obvious when you look at them in three dimensions. Um, whether it's pipes all modeled at four feet off of the ground or uh, countertops that are supposed to rec uh, represent entire cabinetry systems. Um, make sure that you're designing with 3D in mind and then get a good library of high quality families that are actually tested and proven so that they're on hand and easy to access. Get good at making families on the fly because it's really not difficult once you are practiced at it. Actually, um, so Simon and I are both LinkedIn learning instructors talking about the same kind of topic. And um, my latest class that just went up was is basically BIM best practices for uh, BIM workflows when targeting augmented reality and virtual reality and how to work them into your everyday kind of workflow. Uh, so if you go on there, search for Logan Smith or um, I, I'm trouble, struggling to actually remember the name of the class. I think it got renamed since we started it, but uh, probably Revit and ARVR, you should find it. Um, or okay. if you want to know about getting into these engines, search for Simon or me and uh, take a look at our classes. I'll uh, post a link to that course here in the chat. Oh, that'd be great. Revit. Simon's on yeah, top of thank it. You for <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, congratulations on all of that, and especially the LinkedIn learning stuff, because um, I'll, I'll probably be one of your students here shortly. <laughs> Fantastic. Yep. And, uh, you know, we might want to connect also offline about um, – you know, what we can do here at Unify to build content that is VR ready as well, because we are in the business of building content as well. Uh, that would be a great idea. The, the better people's BIM models are, the more ready they are for the kind of work that we do. Awesome. All right. Well, with that being said, I'll go ahead and pass the mic back over to Laura, and she'll handle any of the questions that we received during the presentation. So thanks, guys. It was, it was great talking to you guys. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jay, Simon, and Logan for that wonderful discussion. We'll go ahead and hop into our Q&A. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar and in the chat throughout, you're welcome to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit questions. And it looks like we already have had some great ones come in, so we'll go ahead and get to those. The first question is, what is the deliverable in VR? 
How do you receive and review a VR project? Do I have to install sp special software? Is it a mobile app or is it a file I can download from my desktop? Um, well, I'd say it can be a lot of different ways. <laughs> that's, that's a question with a lot of answers. Um, there, so for instance, there are, there are softwares that are out there like uh, Enscape where someone can make a VR walkthrough that you just send someone that is an executable, they double click on it and it's running. Um, if you want to use it, you do need VR equipment installed and everything. Um, with most of our clients, like if we are delivering a mobile AR application, then we just help them get that app installed on to their device. Um, but I guess, yeah, there's a, uh, it can be many different things depending on what you're using. There are I wish I had a where we clear. build out um, like Unity or Unreal project files and then work with the client to then basically carry those forward, uh, plugging in their own models into that kind of workflow. If you know, if we find clients that um, sometimes they have people who have some experience with uh, Unity or Unreal on their team, uh, we can work with them to, like Logan mentioned earlier, kind of build them tools that then they can use to kind of add new functionality. So really the de deliverable kind of ranges. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, thank you very much. We'll get to our next question here. When a VR model is changed, as mentioned, grabbing the light switches and moving them, how is that data going back to the Revit model? So um, a couple of years back, I built a, uh, a Revit to Unity uh, pipeline for HoloLens. And the way that we handled that, I mean, essentially all we're doing is moving uh, coordinates and sending a signal through, we were using Flux at the time, but it was uh, sending up to Flux and then through Dynamo was basically pushing Revit to say, hey, this, this object that you know about through this you know, object ID, it's now at these coordinates. Um, so essentially just passing those, that little packet of data along rather than kind of a full import export process. Uh, that's kind of the way that we're approaching this moving forward. Okay, excellent, thank you. Our next question is what um, hardware is in the works with VR that we can expect to get in 2019? Oh, definitely um, standalone inside out kind of tracked headsets. So there's the Oculus Quest is a, is a big release that's coming up in the spring or, or summer that um, the idea is that now instead of needing thousands of dollars worth of computer equipment to experience these high quality uh, VR, um, you know, VR or even AR uh, experiences, you'll be able to buy a headset, put it on, and then uh, some of them have cameras on the front that allow pass through kind of a, essentially a camera based augmented reality where you're seeing the world um, I guess some people call it augmented virtuality, where it's essentially a VR experience with real world stuff overlaid into it. But um, ultimately just removing the headset from this tether and getting a lot more free movement, um, especially with things like uh, large scale, like um, location based entertainment and also, you know, job site VR and things like that. Yeah, I was pretty impressed when I tested out the Vive Focus, um, like the Oculus Quest, same. I mean, those, those are going to be direct competitors, I guess. Um, but these, these new headsets that are not tethered to computers, they might not have quite as precise uh, tracking compared to the ones that are tethered, but so much less setup, so much less involved getting started and the um, the rendering in them, the screens are fantastic. I think they're going to be just the thing for a lot of uh, AEC projects. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. The next question. The quality of BIM content is somewhat relative to the user. When it comes to AR slash VR, what does quality content mean? Too heavy, too light, et cetera? 
Uh, that depends a lot on what you want out of your AR and VR. So uh, if you are going for something that is photorealistic and uh, if you're just looking for, I guess, prettiness, then having all of your materials thought through, having everything modeled in a more filled out kind of a way uh, would make a big difference. Or if you're planning on, for instance, although, although say, say you're gonna be replacing your Revit beds with like your furniture with other imported kinds of models, just have them in place and have them ready to swap out because that wouldn't be important. But if you're going for something that is more data focused, then having all of those metadata points filled out uh, would be the crucial part there. So for instance, we were looking at the uh, simulator for flow where people are following pathways through the building. And if you have your building modeled correctly and not all of your, the rooms and areas set up correctly, then we can automatically ha uh, set up those exports uh, and our algorithms can read those data points and set it up for us without us having to do it manually. Excellent, thank you. Next question. How do you bring the Revit model to Magic Leap? I'm curious about the workflow compared to HoloLens. Uh, very similar, uh, because either way, you're gonna be getting it into a game engine, although if you're going for HoloLens, that's only Unity. And if you're going for Magic Leap, you can do either Unity or Unreal. Um, but essentially, you get it into the game engine, and then you're just building to one device or the other. But as far as the import into the game engine, uh, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, we, you can use something like Tritify or Pixies in order to get it with its data or probably go through 3ds Max. Um, we also have classes on LinkedIn Learning about that process for both Unreal and Unity. OK, excellent. And again, um, for everyone interested in those classes, you can look in the, the chat for the link, and then we will also send that out after this webinar. Um, OK, our next question. We're looking to implement a VR project. What are the basic tools I need to get started? You want to get that one, Simon? Um, sure. So basic tools you need to get started would be, I guess, uh, beginning with the hardware, you would need um, either some kind of VR headset. Um, I'd recommend just at this particular moment in time, something like um, the Samsung Odyssey. It just plugs into your computer, and you don't need to set up any external tracking. Um, but you would need some kind of headset uh, or even a, or an iPad um, as well. And then uh, we would recommend going through a game engine. I mean, there's, there's tons of turnkey solutions out there that are great to get started with their trial uh, periods. Like um, Inscape has a great trial. Iris um, Prospect is another great sort of VR uh, visualizer. And these all work directly through Revit. Um, Insight is another um, excellent one. And these all these basically get you to the point where your Revit model or your 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 BIM model of, of whatever kind is in VR and you can view it. But the moment that you want to, uh, let's say, um, start making something like a configurator where I can swap out the you know the the chairs and furniture in my living room, um, that's when we recommend just exporting this into um, a game engine, and then you can use. There's tons of um, essentially built in VR and AR templates you can use. Um, I know Logan can speak more to Unity, but with Unreal, you can essentially select, you know, do I want a VR uh, project, a handheld AR, a head mounted AR, or even like a 2D side scroller. And you can just pick that project and then drop in your, your or import your 3D models and then start walking around it right away. Um, so, I mean, really the, the barrier to entry is is the hardware. All of the software is essentially free to begin with. Um, and then once you start actually building, building things and using these things commercially, then it becomes, you know, um, just a software cost like any other. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you. And we have a question here from your friend, Brett Young. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, of course we do. <laughs> you're a VR startup and you're given 50 million from venture capital. What do you do? <laughs> Give it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's true that we have, uh, we, we've been building this business without uh, venture capital, which has been really nice because we were able to, you know, have full control over uh, what we're doing. Um, and we're focusing on the AC industry, uh, which is, I guess, its own uh, issues with uh, building up a business. But um, I guess, you know, th this might be a different answer for, for both Simon and I. I. I would really be pushing more and more toward the job site augmented reality. That's something that is a personal passion of mine, and I see a lot of potential there. And if I had you know, seemingly limitless development resources, I would be building more robust tools for that area. How about you, Simon? You know, I, I've been going more towards, um, at least what, what's been kind of driving me recently is all of the, the types of data that we can gather through the use of these VR and AR processes. Um, we've been getting a lot of interest in things like, um, like, eye tracking uh, for retail environments. And like just the level of information flowing both ways with, with AR and VR, both like what I'm able to consume, but also what we're able to learn from how you consume that. Uh, there seems to be a ton of applications with that in the retail and healthcare space. So I, I've been really kind of leaning, um, leaning heavily to looking at ways that we can Im make an impact in that that healthcare space in particular there's a tremendous amount of uh, cost and and inefficiency in the process that i think ar and vr really fits nicely into so um, i don't know who knows maybe in in a few years bevel will be branching into construction and healthcare industries with their massively funded <laughs> with that with that 50 million dollars i i really like that uh, a lot of ar and vr applications really focus on uh xr as a an output method whereas the power of of these devices as input is often overlooked uh, but since we are looking at tools to work with data the both input and output being working together is where things get really interesting. Wonderful. Okay, well, it looks like we're ending the near, uh, the end of the hour. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, thank you so much to our audience for engaging with us and asking those great questions. And of course, a huge thank you, Simon and Logan, for taking the time to join us today. We will be sending out um, the recordings of this webinar to all of you who attended later on. And with that, we'll also include a link to a short survey. Our goal is to ensure these webinars are worthwhile to you. So if you would be willing to take a couple of minutes to share your feedback, we'd greatly appreciate it. And then in addition to the recording, we will also include all of the links that we've mentioned here during the webinar today. Thank you everyone so much again for your time. Um, we look forward to having you at our next webinar and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thanks Simon and Logan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.